Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Science Academy's lecture. We will now uh, move on to the third lecture of uh, today's uh, lecture series, uh, which is presented by Dr. Vidita Vaidya itself. We are really interested to hear more and more from you, ma'am. Um, I invite Dr. Vidita Vaidya, ma'am, to present the lecture on the topic, Understanding Neurobiology of Emotions. Thank you, Naduna. I'm going to share my screen. Um, just confirm that you can actually see it. Um, let me just open it up. Can you see my screen? Can someone confirm they can see my screen? So I'm sure that uh, it's visible. Don't want to confirm without on that Niduna can you see my screen yes ma'am it's it's visible it's full okay great thanks Niduna thank you just wanted to confirm because otherwise it, I'll be speaking and there'll be no slides okay um all right so this uh welcome back everyone uh this afternoon I'm going to talk to you about um you know in the first session the first talk today I spoke to you about how life experience can change um, the brain, in particular stressful life experiences, how they impact the hormonal stress, hormonal pathways, and how early life and stress in particular can have very long lasting effects on cognition, mood, as well as molecular and cellular changes. This afternoon, I'm gonna tell you about one particular molecule, which is used routinely to treat anxiety and depression both. Uh, it's the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor called Prozac. Uh, it's marketed as Prozac. Its uh, name is fluoxetine hydrochloride. It's essentially a blocker of the serotonin transporter. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it today. So just to start off with, that's where my lab is. That's uh, the southernmost tip of Mumbai. This is my team. And as I described earlier, our primary interests are in understanding the circuits that regulate emotion and how they're modulated by life experience and drugs. And that's the lab. That's actually literally where we where do, we do all our work. So let's start a little bit first with the history of mental illness and treatment. And it's quite a checkered history in many ways. When you think about how we as a species have treated mental disorders, we've actually struggled to first identify them and then to find reasonable ways of treating them. All the way back in 500 BC, already there was discussion about the fact that there are diseases that are can be broadly thought of as mental disorders. Hippocrates in 460 BC described disorders like melancholia, and it's called melancholia because it's thought to be black bile. Literally, um, melan is black and melancholia is black bile. And it was thought to be that you were producing really bad humors, something was going wrong with you, and you were being upset, you know, taken over by bad vapors. And this is what was responsible for your mental illness. Um, not very far from uh, ideas where people say that somebody is possessed by a demon or somebody has been taken over as a justification of them saying that they're, they're actually not well. And this, this is something that has been commonly seen across society. That men's been sort of tackled by using terminologies like this. Um, Hippocrates already had noticed this. Aristotle contemplated the idea of genetic inheritance in 384 BC. But I don't want to only give you a historical perspective coming from the side of, um, you know, Western civilization or Western history. There is a substantial indigenous history as well, both within India as well as in China and in many other societies where discussions of mental illness and treatment go back even earlier. So the idea earlier than 500 BC, the Sushrut Sahita mentioned something known as Unmad. And Unmad is a Sanskrit word for insanity. Shokaja Unmad refers to resembling excess grief and is essentially the classification of something called depression. So these ideas are old. They were there for a long time. And what were the ways in which people treated them? Well, there were a variety of ways, but some of the most extreme and most horrific, in a sense, involved starvation, purging, a technique called trephination. Trephination is when a hole was bored into the skull such that bad vapors that have possessed the person can actually escape through this hole. So these are skulls that are actually there at the Harvard Museum 
of patients who were suffering from some severe mental illnesses and had these holes drilled into their skulls to actually result in you know supposedly being cured it just tells you that these treatments were done anywhere up to the late 1800s and all the way into the early 1900s lobotomy was done lobotomies actually they went in through the nose and took out a component of the frontal lobe and that itself tells you what a horrific way of treating mental disorders it was and all the way through the 1940s and 50s restraint was used this is why you have the word straight jacket straight jacket essentially so patients in mental um asylums who were not responding and were difficult to control were just this basically tied up or were put in a straight jacket and even trick techniques like hypothermia where they were exposed to extreme cold or insulin shock all kinds of treatments were tried and this itself tells you that we really didn't have an understanding of how to treat the disease by the way this is less than 100 years ago so just to give you a sense of the history of of how mental disorders have been treated and handled in less than 100 years ago lobotomy was performed now what are the diagnostic criteria for someone to be diagnosed as a major depressive so obviously they have to have a depressed mood and all of us go through feeling low at times all of us may say i'm feeling a little depressed today that's not the same as depressed mood which is sustained long lasting and disrupts your ability to do your normal functions it's also you often linked with low self esteem feelingness of worthlessness and guilt decreased ability to concentrate alterations of appetite alterations of weight um, more often than not it's usually a reduction in appetite and weight loss but there are atypical depressions where it goes exactly the opposite insomnia or hypersomnia indicating again hypothalamic dif uh, dysfunction where an inability to sleep or not being able to wake up easily low energy fatigue a uh, psychomotor retardation decreased ability to feel pleasure and recurrent thoughts of death and suicide and the dsm4 and dsm5 criteria which is basically the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders dsm5 criteria require the above symptoms to be reported for at least a period of 2 weeks or longer and when these symptoms start disrupting the ability for the person to do their normal tasks which can in, ex extend from just being able to take care of themselves have a shower go to work functional at work managing their functional uh, social social relationships etc when that gets disrupted as a consequence that's when a patient may potentially be diagnosed with depression so when we think about the way the, these disorders were treated we also need to think about the fact that many of the drugs that are used to treat these disorders were actually discovered by fluke and they were discovered by fluke because there was a strange cocktail of things happened world war 2 happened after world war 2 there were many people who were in asylums many of the veterans who actually came back either because they were ill many of them had tuberculosis they had gone to countries where tb was rampant they picked up tb they came back they were in sanatoriums or asylums where they were recovering and a lot of attempt was being made to treat the tuberculosis in the process two drugs were designed uh, isoniazid and ipronazid on the right hand side is the structure of the molecule isoniazid which was designed to treat tuberculosis as an anti tubercular agent but what was noticed is that many of this was, this was administered to patients who were in asylums or in sanatoriums and then obviously the natural question some of these patients were also depressed they happen to have have tuberculosis but they've come back from war they have lost friends they have whole life has been changed they were also depressed and what was noticed by the clinicians who were treating them was when isoniazid was given it actually helped to remove the depression symptoms so that's how the first fluke discovery of antidepressant following that uh, it was an attempt to understand how does this molecular structure actually work and in across a period of 30 years it became clear at least the primary target of action we still don't understand mechanistically how they work but we have a reasonably good idea what they we definitely know their primary targets of action and imipramine was a drug which is a tricyclic antidepressant which was which is a sort of the first generation of antidepressants that got rolled out it was synthesized based on the structure of isoniazid and it's really almost 30 years later that fluoxetine which is the molecule i'm going to talk about today prozac actually came to bear and that's a second generation antidepressant just to give you a sense of the scale of the problem depression is thought to affect close to 121 to 150 million people worldwide 
the antidepressant drug market in 2011 so exactly 10 years ago was 11 billion the forecasted market is of course not the current figures but it's a substantially large market so now when you look at the history of prozac which ended up being called the most popular antidepressant here's the molecular structure of prozac in the 1950s is when isoniazid ipronizid and all the daughters of isoniazid and ipronizid were synthesized imipramine other molecules like imipramine disipramine nortriptyline these were all tricyclic antidepressants because they had three cyclical structure or they were monoamine oxidase inhibitors. They inhibited a particular enzyme that is responsible for breaking down monoamine neurotransmitters. And then along the way, many people are trying many different things. Literally in the 70s and 80s is when the awareness came about that these drugs are working on the monoamine neurotransmitters. That is different serotonin and dopamine. The three major neurotransmitters that are called monoamines that are present in the mammalian brain, of course, in the human brain as well. And it's in 1986 that Prozac, 1987 is when it really comes to market. And it's the first of the SSRIs, okay? Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So it prevents the reuptake of serotonin back. Into the synapse, which is one way via which it artificial SSRIs. I haven't shown you how it actually works. So in the brain, there are serotonergic neurons, which all sit in the midbrain area right here. And they project all over the brain. And if you think about the synapse, so here's a serotonin neuron. Here's a norepinephrine neuron. Okay, these synapses are seen all over the brain. The cells that produce these uh, neurotransmitters are in the midbrain, but they send projections everywhere, both into the brain and down into the spinal column. So these neurotransmitters would actually be packaged and released from these neurons. So serotonin will come out of this neuron, norepinephrine will come out of this neuron. And drugs like the SSRI or fluoxetine block the reuptake of serotonin. So one of the things is once serotonin comes into the synapse, it's going to bind receptors. And also after some time, you want the serotonin to be cleared. You don't want it just hanging around in the brain. So the natural mechanism is it gets taken up by this transporter and it goes back into the pre-terminal, the pre-synapse, where it either gets broken down by mitochondrial enzymes like the monoamine oxidase or it gets repackaged into these vesicles and recycled. So in a way, think about it as a way of clearing up the amount of serotonin in a synapse. Prozac blocks this reuptake and ends up artificially elevating the amount of time serotonin is there at the synapse. So essentially, when you take Prozac, you are artificially in increasing the amount of time serotonin is present at the synaptic cleft. Okay. Now, just to give you a sense of that in a cartoon format, I mean, in this, through this an animation, here's an animation from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Biointeractive website where you can see a neuron and these flashes represent ionic conductances which represent the action potential. Now, when you zoom in on a synapse, and a synapse could be this location between one neuron and another neuron connecting with each other. Right here is the synapse. Let's zoom in on this, and you can take a look at it a little bit more. It's just an animation, but it'll give you an idea. So here's the presynaptic terminal. Here's the postsynaptic terminal. A impulse arrives at the presynaptic terminal. When an impulse arrives at the presynaptic terminal, channels open, calcium channels, and calcium comes in. Okay. This calcium coming in binds two proteins on these vesicles and these vesicles fuse with the presynaptic membrane and release the contents, in this case, serotonin. Serotonin will then go and bind to receptors. Either some of them are, one of them is a channel. Most of them are G protein, uh, protein coupled receptors. And the signal will so get transmitted to the next cell. What Prozac does is it prevents it from the serotonin from coming back into this presynapse elevating the amount of time serotonin floats around at the synapse. So here's a zoom in of this. Here's a serotonin synapse. So serotonin is being released like this. Prozac will come and block this. So it cannot be taken back up. And because it cannot be taken back up, you end up with much more serotonin floating around in the synaptic cleft for way longer. So basically, if a depressed person takes Prozac, they will end up with elevated serotonin in the brain because serotonin is just hanging around at the synapses for longer. Now, let's look at a history of this, the use of this particular um, 
antidepressant. It became a very popular antidepressant, partly because it had less side effects than the tricyclics. Um, remember that serotonin is not only made in the brain. There's a lot of serotonin in your gut. There's a lot of serotonin in the periphery. Similarly, norepinephrine is in the periphery. Remember, norepinephrine and epinephrine regulate heart rate. They regulate gut motility. So does serotonin. So when you start elevating serotonin or norepinephrine using these antidepressant drugs, you're not only increasing it in the brain, you're increasing it everywhere. You don't have a clean way of saying, I will only change it in one part and not everywhere else. So it goes up everywhere. And associated with that, there are gut-related side effects. There are appetite-related side effects. There can be heart-rate-related side effects. There can be blood pressure-related side effects. So these drugs, unfortunately, come with their side effects. So when the first SSRI came on board, Prozac, the reason it became so popular was because its side effect profile was very good. It produced relatively far lesser side effects than the tricyclics. And so it became the drug of choice for many, many people because people were willing to take it and people found that it reduced their, they were not getting such severe side effects. This just gives you an idea of the number of people in millions who started taking Prozac in the US across period of time after it was launched by Eli Lilly. And it went on to become, became, become a blockbuster drug. So it's a 2.6, sorry. This Hi, can you hear me now? Is that clear? Can everyone hear me? Uh, uh, the slide is not visible right now. Yeah, I'm just gonna put it out. I'm just gonna put it on. Something went wrong in the process of my trying to share it. And um, can you see it now? Is it clear? Is the slide visible now? Can someone confirm they can see the slide so I can just carry on? Ma'am, slide yeah. is visible. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, this became a big block. So this just gives you a sense of the key milestones in the development of fluoxetine or Prozac, okay? So 1970s is when people began to even realize that these drugs, remember these drugs were discovered by fluke. We didn't know what they worked on. We knew that the drug worked before we knew how it worked. Okay. We knew it works and we had some idea. It was really the 70s that people began to realize that it is working via changing levels of serotonin and norepinephrine. So it was in the 70s by, you know, these drugs were developed. In the early 1970s, in 1975 is when the name fluoxetine is actually approved. It goes up for approval. And really, 1986 is the first time it gets launched. It gets launched in 1987 in the United States. Already within five years after that, its annual sales is $1 billion. It reaches $2 billion by 1995. And it loses its expiry, ex sort of expires in terms of exclusive market by 2001. But in that interim of time, it has made a total sales of $22 billion, just to give you an idea of the scale of the market for this drug. In fact, this is a cover of Newsweek where Prozac is sp spoken about as a breakthrough drug for depression. So, but there's something interesting that's going around this time as well. Okay, so now if you look back, I was here in this timeline, I'm at 2001, and I'm telling you this is when the market has expired in the United States and generics that can make pros, uh, you know, 
can make this particular molecule can also come in and make it so it's not just that eli lilly has to make it other other companies can also manufacture because the exclusivity has expired now look at 2003 and what's happening okay gsk which is basically glaxo smith klein beecham submits a report that paroxetine which is another ssri similar in its target of action is associated with pediatric suicidality and in fact there is an increased risk of suicide in patients who take this particular drug this then starts opening up a bunch of questions from the patient support group saying what is going on we want to see the data for when this drug is given to children or if it is given to adolescents and teenagers remember that these were the drugs that people preferred to give to adolescents who were severely depressed and even children with depression there is also drugs that were the drug of choice to be given to women who had postpartum depression or women who had gestational depression um so these were the safest drugs so they were being used and at the same time these reports are coming out about the idea that they may ha have inexplicably opposing or paradoxical effects in children or in adolescents and so this just summarizes that entire window of time where people are writing and saying show us the data for how it works in children and adolescents and up till then the companies had been bundling the data and showing it collectively for the entire population not just the younger population up to 25 years of age just over and above and when the data got broken down people began to realize that it can have unexpected effects in younger on the younger developing or adolescent or juvenile brain as compared to what it has in the adult and that eventually across a period of 2 years resulted in a new safety guideline such that all of these drugs were required to issue a black box warning a black box warning is the highest warning for a drug that continues to be manufactured that is to say that please do not use this be aware that this may have unexpected effects in children and adolescents so this is just the antidepressant prescriptions and you can see that the prescriptions were at a peak here and this is when the federal drug administration in the us issues a strong warning saying there is a real problem and then on going with that and eventually warning started appearing on labels at this point and why is this interesting and why is this of relevance well in many ways most drugs that are used are often used and tested in adults and in volunteers who are adults very rarely is it as extensively tested in children and this becomes a serious issue because one thing one has to remember is children are not small adults in how their body handles a drug they are actually so you can't simply say that so many kilograms is an adult the child is only so many kilograms so we just bring down the dose and treat a child with the same just adjust the dose and treat a child because a child's brain is not identical to an adult's brain at all so that's where it becomes quite interesting for neuroscientists so at the same time while all this was going on in the clinical space many people preclinically were studying this in animal models so when you look at rodent models and you look at mice and rats and here's a rat a spray dolly rat on the right hand side corner you can actually study the effects of these drugs on the brain of animals also and these drugs have specific behavioral effects even in animal models so for example if you use a test like the open field test what is the open field test it's essentially a plain black box in which the animal is put and the animal is allowed to freely explore explore this box and the animal has never seen this box box before so any of you who have seen a rat or a mouse in your house or anywhere will realize that animals like to cling to the corners of things they don't run into the center and sit in the center they spend most of their time on the periphery so if you start looking at drugs that treat depression and anxiety what is interesting is then in animals when you give it it changes the behavior of the animal such that the animal will explore the center more it will travel more distance in the center and i'll show you some of that data here's just one particular measure you can also use it in what is called the novelty suppressed feeding test and you usually don't test it only on one behavior you usually test it on multiple behaviors so um here is a test where you basically put the animal in this black box and in the center of the black box is a very bright light and in the bright light area there is a small platform which has food on it now the animal that goes into this chamber has been deprived of food usually for 24 to 36 hours so it's pretty hungry so when it gets put into the test the test becomes a test of conflict the food is in the center the animal is hungry so it wants to eat but the food is in the most anxiety promoting area of this chamber it's very brightly lit 
it's on an elevated chamber and so it's a risk so the animal is now in conflict do i eat or do i stay away from this and what is intriguing is that animals that have been treated with antidepressants will overcome the latency and go and eat the food much more easily so there is a decline in latency so what these are are proxy measures of course you cannot treat an animal and ask are you feeling depressed and is your mood being elevated because animals don't get depressed at least not the way we can describe depression in human beings what we can do is do tests in animals where the drug causes specific behavioral changes and we can study those behavioral changes and what is remarkable is that most antidepressants will have specific kinds of so, so drugs which are not antidepressants don't give you this effect okay all right so here's just to show you how an open field test is actually done this is from the the maze website here's what an open field test looks like it's just a black box with a animal in the center and you can actually leave the animal and then you have an infrared camera that's tracking everything animals don't like the center so they'll spend most of their time hanging around in the corners but every now they'll go into the center and come out and they'll explore it but most of the time they will be on the corners and that's what i showed you in the previous drawing actually it will come up in the next one i think let's see uh, i'll show you in the next drawing what it actually looks like so you can actually measure how much time the animal spends on the outer edge versus in the center you can measure the speed with which it travels you can measure how much time it has spent what is the actual number of meters it has spent in the periphery versus the center there are many many things how how much time did it take before it entered the center all of these can be measured so it's a very easy way to analyze this and you can watch the behavior of large numbers of animals without a problem animals that take drugs that increase anxiety actually spend um, you know less time going into the center anxiogenic drugs they will spend less time in the center whereas things that actually reduce anxiety the animal will end up spending significantly more time in the center okay now here's what actually was fascinating remember i showed you the data 2 minutes ago which was for what happens when you give prozac here's fluoxetine prozac to an adult the animal gets an anxiolytic like response reduces anxiety reduces anxiety it spends more time in the center it takes far less time to go and eat okay but what happens if you do the same experiment in a baby where is you give prozac to the baby and you now wait for a few months and you study its behavior when it's an adult then something very weird happens it's exactly the opposite that the happens it increases anxiety you actually spend less time in the center and you take way more time to actually go and eat the food the reason i'm telling you this is this was unexpected generally the view was oh this drug is an antidepressant but here i'm showing you data that when you give it matters because if it is the baby brain that gets exposed to elevated serotonin it actually programs anxiety more anxiety which lasts for months and months and months so this is where uh, two of my graduate students really talented wonderful graduate students that i'm lucky to work with ambalika sarkar and parul chachra who are now both off at uh, greener horizons doing interesting things with their lives when they were graduate students a lab asked the following question what is so responsible for this very different effect there's a dependent effect you give prozac this drug which is routinely given in the market you give it a dose of 15 mg per kg to this rat in adulthood and it will reduce anxiety and work like an antidepressant which means it works the way you expect it to okay so this is as expected it's been used in the clinic it works the same way in animals it's a very robust clean reduces anxiety reduces depression like behavior uh what about in the baby brain if you give it in the babies and then you wait for them to become adults and study the behavior it increases anxiety and increases a form of behavior that's considered to be almost depressive like now these behaviors please understand in animals are not going to be full fledged anxiety and full fledged depression they are measures or proxy measures that serve as a way of looking at how the behavior of the animal has changed what uh, uh, ambalika and uh, parul decided to do was the following oh, they fed 10 mg per kg not 15 10 mg per kg to pups and they fed it like this in a feeding needle so the animal likes to drink this up because it has a little bit of sugar as a background so we have control animals that are just given the sucrose solution and pups that are receiving the uh, the fluoxetine in the sucrose you feed it to them every day from p2 to p21 then you study them when they are adolescents you see how their play behavior has changed which is a proxy first measure of how adult behavior is going to change 
juvenile play in animals is actually an indicator of how adult behavior will e eventually emerge and then you wait for them to become adults and you run them on many many different tests the open field test the elevated plus maze test the novelty suppressed feeding test the first swim test and the modest water maze and then we waited for them to become really old so these are all different groups so one group is studied here then another group is studied here uh, then another group is waited till it becomes middle age and we study it then and to cut a long story short i'll come to the, some of the examples of behavior i want to show you what this actually looks like so if you look at juvenile play behavior you're watching two animals they're juveniles you're looking at run and chase follow and chase behavior pinning pinning behavior bouncing behavior these are things you can actually just watch the video and actually measure okay and so what you see and here for example is the elevated plus maze which is another way of measuring anxiety so in the elevated plus maze there is a maze which looks like a plus it is raised 2 feet off the ground so it's at a height and then there are two arms that are closed because they have this protection and then there are two open arms and now when you put a mouse or a rat in the center an animal that is a little nervous will try to spend its time in these closed arms okay it won't spend so much time in the open arms so if you give the animal a drug that actually reduces anxiety then it tends to go into these open arms there is an drug that increases anxiety will actually send the animal into the closed arms so you can actually measure the amount of time they spend in the open arms amount of time they spend in the closed arms the distance the latency to enter etc 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 and so this is a way by which you can actually measure the behavior just to give you a sense of the kind of measurements people do okay so here's what ambalika and parul did they treated these animals from postnatal day 2 which is 2 days after they were born till postnatal day 21 which is really a young baby in a sense and you are feeding it prozac every day in the drinking water happily drinks it up in this little tube and then you wait for them to become juveniles which is the first time you test them okay and so there's no drug on board by the time you test them the drug is stopped on postnatal day 21 so they are 28 days old and you run them on a battery of juvenile related behaviors and already you notice that the amount of time spent on social grooming on pouncing has become less whereas follow and chase is not altered at all so you're seeing the beginning of what you call fragmented play behavior indicative of the fact that these animals are showing deficiency in normal social interactions between conspecifics okay conspecifics are others of the same species So then you wait for these animals to become adults. Sorry, what happened? Oops. Ah. So you wait for them to be adults, which is around about two months of age, and then you run them again on a whole bunch of behaviors. Here's what happens in the open field test. The open field test was that dabba that I told you about, where you see how the animal is behaving, and what you can see is the time and the distance spent in the center is less, but the amount, the it, it, the latency to approach the center is significantly increased. It doesn't like to spend time in the center. So in fact what this tells you is this animals is showing more anxiety that's also true for the elevated plus maze the time spent in the open arms the distance in the open arms is all reduced indicative of more anxiety on the novelty suppressed feeding test the amount of time that they take to approach the food is increased and on the forced swim test which is a measure of behavioral despair in which the animal is put in a tank of water and you just look at the amount of escape attempts the animal makes then and if the animal just gives up the animal will just float okay and so animals that are normally given an antidepressant will struggle and attempt to escape and will not just give up so that's a measure of behavioral despair and what you see is that these animals actually exhibit significantly more behavioral despair and when you wait till 18 months so now this is 18 months after the drug was ever given okay there's no drug nothing on board at 18 months these animals are still showing increased anxiety on the open field and are also showing increased despair like behavior on the f4 swim test what this tells you is that this developing baby brain is exposed to elevated levels of serotonin then for the rest of the life of this animal it shows aberrant behavior on these measures so then the question becomes what is going on if you do it in this this is a drug by the way which is used to treat depression and it is routinely given and has made eli lilly a lot of money but if you give this drug to babies at least rodent babies and in this window in fact it produces increased anxiety and increased depression that lasts for the rest of the life of the animal we checked all the way out to 22 months now this is interesting because this window in rodents 
overlaps or would be the equivalent of the first few years of life in the last trimester of a human. Keep in mind that women who have gestational depression and postpartum depression are given these drugs. These drugs cross the placental barrier. They also cross through in breast milk, which means that infants would be exposed to these drugs. So this becomes very important then to understand that this drug is not working the way it normally works in a developing brain. In fact, there's something special about this early lifetime window. And why is this effect lasting for the rest of life? Well, it could be for many reasons. Maybe it changes gene expression of some critical factors. And because it's happening in a developing brain, it changes this and then changes it for good. Maybe it changes structure in the brain, maybe neurons and circuits and the way they're connected to each other. Because remember, this is a developing brain. Lots of changes are going on in the brain at the time the drug is given. Maybe it changes the way structure is actually being stabilized. Or maybe it changes the functional response at the level of synapses. It could be one of these. It could be two of these. It could be all of these. It's not clear, right? So we didn't understand that. So we were interested in asking what were the changes. And by the way, there are changes at all levels. But for today's talk, I'm only going to tell you about some gene expression changes that happen. So what Ambalika decided to do was to do an unbiased approach where she treated animals with Prozac in this early window, waited for them to become adults, and then just took out two parts of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. The hippocampus we just talked about a little while before. And even today, I'm going to right now, also I'm going to be talking about the hippocampus because these structures play such an important role in regulating mood. And what she did is she just said in an unbiased manner, I'm going to ask what are the gene expression changes in these two parts of the brain? And many things are changed. And remember, this is months and months after the drug. So this is a consequence of having had a history of the drug. It's not a consequence of acute effects of the drug. Many things change. Many gene expression changes are noticed, several of which overlap. And one of the common targets is a very interesting target. It's a histone deacetylase. So I have to introduce you to what a histone deacetylase. You know what chromosomes are. And you know that chromatin is essentially made of DNA wrapped around the nucleosome, right? So it's like this beads on a string model, right? This is chromatin. And then this is going to get folded, 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 folded to form this big chromosome, right? Now on these nucleosomes and this histones, the histones often have tails which have different signatures. They could be methylation, acetylation, phosphorylation, sumoylation, acylation, a variety of different tags, okay? And when you remove or add these tags, it changes the way the gene expression, if there is a gene here, the manner in which the gene will be expressed. So for example, imagine a situation in which you have a histone. So let me see if I can, the histone deacetylase. The histone deacetylase will remove the acetyl group. And by removing the acetyl group, it tends to increase the amount of compaction so if you get more compact, it's difficult for protein machinery associated with trans, uh, you know, with transcription to actually access the DNA. And because it can't access it, the gene expresses to a lesser extent. So now why am I telling you all this? So let's just watch this video because hopefully this will give you some sense of the kind of things that I'm talking about. So here's a cell that they've just shown you. There's a nucleus. You can see these chromosomes floating around inside it. And we'll zoom in and look at what's actually going on. Okay. So let's say you start zooming in on the cell. And this in your cartoons, you would have seen these chromosomes, the way they look here. This is usually what you see in metaphase stage. Otherwise, it's just one big ball of spaghetti. But let's say you zoom in. Okay. When you zoom in, what you can see is here's how tightly it's compacted. It's crazy. This is the chromatin. It's compacted like this to allow it to even fit in, right? Right? Now, when you zoom in even further and further and further, now you start seeing that each of these things is a beads on a string. Here's a nucleosome with histone proteins and the DNA wrapped around it, two and a half turns of DNA around each nucleosome. And each of these histones has tails, puchris or tails or whatever you want to call them. And these histones are of many kinds, H2A, H2B, H3, H4, etc. And these tails will be allowed to have more modifications. So here's an acylation. Okay, when it's acylated because of the charge related changes, this actually opens up and loosens it. So when you're acetylated, you tend to be a little bit more loose in conformation. 
And when you become loose in confirmation, you make it open and accessible. So here's a histone acetyl transferase. And here's a histone deacetylase. This adds an acetyl group. This removes an acetyl group. Okay. So when the acetyl groups are added, it opens up the chromatin. And because it's less compacted and more open, you can make more copies of mRNA and you end up making a higher. So your, your gene expression from that particular gene would be upregulated or you will end up with more copies of mRNA. OK, now when you think of a histone deacetylase, it does exactly the opposite, comes up and removes these acetyl groups. By removing these acetyl groups, it ends up compacting the entire DNA such that you become so compact it's difficult to access the gene and it's difficult to make mRNA copies which are essential for which essentially is what is transcription and so you transcribe less mRNA and because of that you end up with less copies of that gene being expressed less mRNA being made for that particular gene okay so hopefully that explains it now what was fascinating that Ambalika noticed was that when when you gave these animals Prozac and then you studied them both at postnatal day 21 in adulthood and at 18 months of age, this gene HDAC4 just was upregulated throughout. Okay, this is the mRNA expression of this particular gene. So HDAC4 is upregulated. You end up with higher levels of HDAC4, not just in the hippocampus, but also in the prefrontal cortex. And it's up and it's up throughout life. So even though the drug was only used now and shut off, even 18 months later, you have a nice robust upregulation of HDAC4. And fascinatingly, there are also several genes that are simultaneously downregulated. mTOR being one of the most interesting ones because this refers to a critical kinase family that is responsible for maintaining the structure of neurons and dendritic arbors and spines on neurons. Okay. So what is interesting is that this is only happens when you take Prozac when you're a baby. If you give rats Prozac in adulthood, nothing happens to HDAC4. It is not altered at all, nor is the rest of this stuff. None of this. So you can see that the gene expression changes that you get with postnatal. PNFLX refers to postnatal. AFLX refers to adult. It's completely different. So the same drug, depending on what time it is given, gives you completely different effects. It's, it's the baby brain. It dysregulates HDAC for the rest of life. Now, that is interesting to us. So what Ambalika did was the, she next asked, okay, if HDAC4 is getting upregulated, is this enzyme going and sitting on the promoter of important genes and removing the acetyl groups from these promoter regions? So what she did is a chromatin immunoprecipitation assay, where essentially what you do is you use an antibody against HDAC4. Wherever HDAC4 is there, you will go and bind with the antibody because the antibody recognizes HDAC4. Then you cross-link it so that it's a permanent binding. Then you can actually access that stretch and you ask, where is HDAC4 sitting? By using primers, you can figure out where it's actually sitting. And what you find is that there is way more HDAC4 at the mTOR promoter and the GI promoter than there is in control animals. This is normalized to control. What it's telling you is, yes, you're making more HDAC4 and more HDAC4 is going and sitting associated with the histones of specific promoters. And associated with HDAC sitting there, there is a big decline in acetylation of the histones at these regions, which makes sense. HDAC4's job is to remove acetylation. So when HDAC4 goes and sits at the TOR promoter, the acetylation goes down at these promoters. So GI and TOR promoter acetylation associated with these promoters has gone down. Now, what does that mean? So if it if HDAC4 comes here and it sits here, it's removing this acetyl group associated with this and presumably that contributes to the reduction in the expression of these genes. So then the next question Ambalika asked was, what if we don't allow HDAC4 to work? Okay, so that's what she did. She used a broad spectrum HDAC inhibitor, sodium butyrate, so here are now three groups of animals. Control, animals given Prozac, animals given Prozac, but you don't allow the HDAC4 to work. I mean, you actually don't allow other HDACs to work because it's a broad spectrum HDAC inhibitor. And then you look months later. And what do you see? Here's the effect caused by Prozac. You get an increase in despair-like behavior. But if you don't allow HDAC 
work by inhibiting HDAC at the same time as giving Prozac, you lose all the behavioral effects. Negative behavioral effects of Prozac are gone. That strongly tells us that it is here. Here's an example of a trace. So here's, for example, a representative trace from one rat. Of course, we would be doing this in ends of 10 to 15 animals per group. Here's a sample from one. You can see this control animal. And if you just follow an animal over a period of 10 minutes and you make a track and you can actually trace the track, you can see this animal prefers the periphery over the center, but it goes to the center. Animals that have had Prozac spend more time on the periphery and don't go to the center as much. Unless at the same time as Prozac, you also block the HDAC. If you block the HDAC, it goes back to what controls look like. Okay. So that's true. Ambalika decided to ask another question. She said, what if I just take, take an animal? I don't give any Prozac. I don't do anything else. I'm simply going to go in and take a virus that makes HDAC and stick it into the hippocampus. So you can surgically deliver the virus. So the animal is nicely anesthetized. And, you know, it has a full-fledged anesthesia. And you can do these neurosurgeries where you deliver the virus. Here, the virus is shown in green. You deliver the virus into the hippocampus. And that virus will cause the animal to make more HDAC4. And that we can confirm by looking at the levels of HDAC4. Here's the expression of HDAC4 protein. Here's the mRNA. And then you say, okay, we stitch the animal back together. Let it be for a few weeks. And then we look at its behavior. And when we do, we realize that simply making more HDAC4 in the hippocampus is enough to produce despair-like behavior. So this, is, this hopefully gives you a little bit of a clue that when you take a drug and you give it, it matters what age, it matters what's the substrate. Because the same drug can have exactly opposite effects in this group and in this group. And this is probably because to some extent you're recruiting different machinery in this window and this window. In fact, the gene expression changes here are completely different from the gene expression changes here. In addition, there's also a completely different milieu of serotonin receptors here and here. And that also is important. Since then, we've extended to show that the juvenile window is quite different. Here in the baby window, it causes an increase in anxiety and pro-depressant and persistent. In the juvenile window, it reduces anxiety, reduces depression-like behavior, and is persistent. In the adult window, it reduces anxiety, reduces depression-like behavior, but it's transient. It only works when the drug is there. You stop the drug, all the effects go away. In these two effect windows, whether the drug is there or not, months and months, months later, you can see the effect. So that's fascinating. Amongst the challenges for the field is that while we find many behavioral changes and we can study them, we can also find cellular and molecular changes. It's very hard to make the jump between showing that a molecular change contributes to changes in cellular architecture, which then drives changes in behavior. So this remains one of the central challenges in neuroscience. OK, I'd like to stop by acknowledging Parul and Ambalika, who did a body of the work. This project has then been ably continued by Utkarsha in my laboratory and Sashena. There's Utkarsha back here and Sashena in the lab. Sashena is an assistant professor with the Kasturba Health Society and a close collaborator. Utkarsha is a senior graduate student in the lab. Here's my team. None of this work is possible without, of course, the animals we work with and our very talented animal house veterinarian in charge, Dr. Sheetal Suryavanshi. Funding comes from TIFR, DBT COE grant in epigenetics, and the uh, Padmavati Venkateshwara Foundation grant. Uh, my collaborators are Catherine Pena and Eric Nessler at Mount Sinai. And I am re ready to take questions. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful class. It was was really new to hear that this medicine works differently on different age groups. And it was uh, so insightful class. So there are so many questions there. So we can go to the questions. Uh, interesting that medicine dosage does not relate with body mass in children as it does in adults. Has this been taken into account for drug approval by FDA for all drugs or even any at all? <laughs> Very good question. I mean, it is taken into consideration, obviously, because uh, drug metabolism can differ, pharmacokinetics, pharmacoavailability. Um, you know, the first pass effects at the level of the liver can differ between children and adults. So it is taken into account. What happens sometimes is that 
you end up with volunteers in the older age group more easily even for example drugs that are given to men versus women sometimes people have not broken out the date broken down the data to see if there's any sex specific differences sometimes in metabolism so just saying something someone is smaller by size and reducing the dose is not enough so this is factored in but it has remained a source of substantial problem because patient groups would like to see the broken down data so you know you want to see what happens in which age group you want to see that and sometimes drug companies and uh, regulatory bodies don't release that easily this is a great story of an example of why patient groups pushed and said show us all the data so there is always this tussle between commercial interests uh, interests which are driven by patient groups obviously regulatory body i mean it it's complex it's quite complex and it it's a very important factor that one really be aware of this they factor it in but sometimes it still results in serious issues thank you ma'am then we go to next question does mood stabilizers become addictive because missing them for a single day is overwhelming uh mood stabilizers do are not a classical group of compounds that become addictive uh because of the fact that uh they don't usually hit the ventral tegmental nucleus accumbens projection which is the circuit in the brain that's associated with reward so unlike drugs like heroin or cocaine or nicotine or alcohol which target that circuitry mood stabilizers which fall into the category of lithium and other neuroleptics are not targeting that pathway so they are not classically addictive okay they're not addictive like drugs of abuse what happens is that there can be a psychological dependence which is that you associate your feeling better with the availability of those drugs that's quite different from our actual drug addiction so um that gets trickier yeah but they're not class Physically addictive, not like uh, drugs of abuse. Uh, I think she understands that, and we go to the next question. Can serotonin reuptake uh, take place by other mechanism as well? If yes, what are they? Not really. I mean, most of the serotonin that goes take gets taken back up by the serotonergic neuron. So the neuron that is making serotonin. most of the serotonin that is taken back up is taken up through the serotonin transporter to some extent the all the monoamine transporters so there's a norepinephrine transporter dopamine transporter serotonin transporter they're not very clean so when you're at very high levels of serotonin some serotonin can go into a dopamine transporter or norepinephrine transporter so they are they're not as clear cut as being so clear in their separation so there is that possibility but 99% of the serotonin clearance happens through the serotonin transport thank you ma'am next question does depression always depend on one's life situation there have been people who have lives one would look up to but still they suffer from depression yeah i mean it's not necessarily that it has to be associated with profound stress or profound challenges in fact uh, i think uh, you know i mean it's the human condition um we are all at risk at some point in life of feeling depressed and feeling severely depressed and requiring help um something like 15 to 20% of the population at some stage in their life will you know that that's a very substantial number so the risk is that anyone is predisposed and could have it at any time and depends sometimes on life circumstances there is also idiopathic depression which happens without an obvious reason where you look around for a challenge in life and you can't find an obvious challenge so you're not talking about great grief or great suffering or great trauma it's happening independent of that and that that also is a, a large component so it's not an you cannot find an obvious reason in addition manic depression uh, rates of manic depression many manic depressives have been amongst the most creative people you know people like william blake virginia woolf some of the greatest poets and writers of our time have also suffered from depression so um this is not to view it only as a handicap it is a it is a difficult illness but some of the most talented and amazing artists and minds have suffered from it so one has to keep in mind that the person is not the illness the illness is a is a reality but the person is way more 
more than just the illness. The illness, you know, every one of us, we live long enough on this planet is going to get something or the other. Some illness or the other will show up. I mean, the machines, they do, they, do, they break down. I mean, that's just the reality. But yes, there are some amazing individuals who one has deep admiration for. I mean, one example is Van Gogh, who also went through serious mental health challenges and his paintings bring so much joy to so many people world over. So much of the poetry and the books written and people like Sylvia Plath, uh, amazing poetry. And, you know, you would at the same time think what this young mind went through was profound depression. So, yes, it's uh, it's complex in that it is, uh, you know, it doesn't always have to depend on one's life situation. No. Yes. OK, then we go to the next question. I have been administering fluvoxamine along with mood stabilizer Risperdal for OCD. What makes both of them work better together? Yeah, the combination therapy is actually really interesting. I mean, it's interesting that a lot of these drugs, um, you know, are often co-administered because an individual. So, you know, OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder. Very often one would think about OCD as being a basal ganglia circuitry associated disorder because that's a circuit associated with repetitive behavior, which is the classical hallmark component of OCD, which is an inability to break a repeated pattern and a ha habit that then establishes and becomes absolutely pathological. But <clears throat> antidepressants are used to treat both anxiety and OCD, also used for the treatment of bulimia and anorexia. So <clears throat> it remains unclear why specific combinations work better. Um, very often, it's a personal decision by the psychiatrist what combination is going to be the right one to go with. So for example, Risperidol would be working on the basal ganglia circuitry given its targets, primary targets. Fluvoxamine would be presumably working on serotonergic circuits, which also drive better performance from the dopaminergic pathways. So there's this debate about why the combination works better because it's serotonin is also influencing basal ganglia circuitry. And that's probably why. Mechanistically, the circuits are still poorly understood in terms of the complementarity between these pathways. How do serotonergic neurons directly impact on dopaminergic neurons? In, in this case, dopaminergic neurons obviously of the nigra and the uh, projecting into the striatum. So cannot give you a precise answer except to say that it is likely because there is an interplay between these two pathways. And it becomes very much a case of psychiatrists taking the call of what is the best combination therapy. But combination therapies sometimes work very well. OK, ma'am. Uh, there are so many question, other questions. But uh, right now, the time is very short. Uh, I think we want to wind up the session and we go to the next, next session. Your class was amazing, ma'am. Thank you so much for your time and effort. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are going to the last and final session of uh, today's, and that's the fourth lecture we are going to hear. And it's from Dr. Adatil Vijayan Sir. Uh, and he's going to take uh, uh, his topic is on recent innovative technologies beneficial to society. So let's go to his profile. Dr. Vijayan is ICMR. Emeritus Medical Scientist at the Department of Biotechnology, Cochin University of Science and Technology, Kochi. He took his BSc Honors, MSc, and PhD from Banaras Hindu University. He worked as. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Uh, but the sound is a little low. Not that clear. Okay. He, awa he awarded Ford Foundation Postdoctoral yeah, Fellowship at University of Texas. Yes, sir. Sir, I think there is some net issues there, connective issues. Your sound is not clear. Uh, I get, I get some disturbing disturbances in the sound. Otherwise, it is all right. The connection is fine. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, let me complete. Okay. 
He, uh, he was awarded Ford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship at the University of Texas Southwest Medical School at Dallas, USA. Later, Dr. Vijayan served as a professor of Central University, Hyderabad. He is recipient of Alexander Von Helmholtz Fellowship in Neuroscience and Medicine at Max Planck Institute, Germany. He was visiting professor in Department of Psychology, University of Texas, Southwestern Medical School. He was invited as professor and head of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and Dean School of Life Science, Pondicherry Central University. Dr. Dr. Vijayan holds membership in various body, bodies and he is fellow of National Academy of Science in India and he was president of Endocrine Society of India. He was elected as council member, International Neuroendocrine Federation. He serves as the president, Society of Bio, Biotechnologist. Dr. Vijayan guided 12 PhD and 15 MPhil students in neurobiology. You can cut out. You can. Sir. Sir? Yeah, you can cut short. Is that okay? Can I start now? Yeah, yeah, sir. Can I start now? I invite you, sir. Is there any can presentation? Yes, yeah, sir. You can. Uh, you okay. Uh, no, I will. No. So, uh, can you hear me now clearly? Not clear, sir. Sound is a little it's bit low. Clear? My voice is clear? No, sir. There is some, there is some disturbance. Yes. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, am I audible? Okay. Can I start? Okay, now? fine, sir. Well, anyway, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, since I already spoke during the inaugural session uh, about the purpose of these lectures, I don't want to spend much time on introduction. What I'm going to uh, present to you, the students, uh, since they are all uh, undergraduate and postgraduate and even research students, uh, some of the I'm going to highlight some of the recent technologies which has been in the process of uh, development and it has developed uh, and in the process of uh, uh, applying to the uh, uh, human welfare. Okay. Now these technologies which are already in the process for the last several years but now being applied uh, uh, all of them from being basic science discoveries and now have tremendous potential, what we call disruptive potentials, okay? Now I just chose uh, 10 uh, such technologies and just going to highlight and then enlighten the students about in what way it is going to influence our life. And that is going to, and the scientists predict that these uh, 10 technologies is going to change the world in the coming decade, okay? Now, uh, just as a brief, uh, recently, I'm sure uh, all of you or many of, most of you know that there is what we call World Economic Forum. Now, the World Economic Forum is by the, constituted by the several nations. Now, the Economic Forum have an expert network of experts that in collaboration with Scientific American. Now, Scientific American is a very, very uh, popular and standard scientific journals where all the summaries of the discoveries, the detailed summaries of the discoveries are published. In fact, all the Nobel Prize winning uh, scientific discoveries, technology or science or other areas are uh, published in Scientific American. In a, detailed form okay so that is the importance of a journal i'm sure many of the students will be knowing it and if those who are seen it i would advise them if they want to pursue a career in science you must search for scientific american and uh, get hold of it and start reading it okay so the uh, this world economic forums expert network in collaboration with the scientific american 
compiled and produced a report highlighting 10 emerging technologies. These technologies had to offer significant benefits to societies and economies and have the power to alter established ways of doing things. So we have over the period of centuries or decades, uh, many things we have been doing, we have established that we have established ways of doing things. So once these technologies are being uh, applied, that is going to change the uh, world. Now, because the, the, the tremendous potential these technologies carry, they are called disruptive potentials. Uh, and uh, the students can look at what is the <clears throat> uh, word, uh, what is called the uh, disruptive potentials. Now, for example, just think, what if drinking water could be drawn from the desert air easily without requiring enormous amounts of electricity from a grid? So if, you, if one is able to take a glass or a tumbler, stand in the air and throw, draw water, if you get your tumbler or the glass filled with the water, pure drinking water, that is going to be a tremendous achievement. And that is, so I'm just going to give few highlight some of that, how it is. And the, another, if you think, what if a doctor could do a biopsy for a suspected cancer without a blade of any sort? Another important, what if we didn't have to wait too long for the result? Now, technologies that make these visions a reality are expected to become increasingly commonplace in the next few years. My talk today highlights 10 such emerging technologies. The technologies has already emerged, but we are in the process of applying it, okay? Number one, now, the technologies that pull moisture from the air are now solar powered. We already have the technology, but it is solar powered or it needs tremendous amount of electricity. We all know billions of people lack access to clean drinking water for all parts of the year, or must travel far to collect it. Now, extracting water directly from the air would be an immeasurable boon to them, okay? But existing technologies generally require a high moisture climate and a lot of electricity. So that is what the existing technology we, we have to put in. So it becomes very, very expensive affair. Uh, now, uh, this problem, problem is now becoming more tractable thanks to a robust system of development that rely on readily available energy from the sun. They are scalable and work even in arid regions where a third of the world's population lives often in poverty and the scarcity of drinking water. Now, the, the example, the, the, one of the most important uh, contribution is from the collaborators at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the University of California at Berkeley have tested an approach that requires no electricity at all. You can take it, as I told you, a tumbler in your hand, stand in the air, and your tumbler will fill with water. Okay, that's, so that is a revolutionary idea. Now, the team intends for its technology to overcome a notable problem with the most materials capable of absorbing water from the atmosphere. Uh, they give up trapped water only when heated substantially, which takes an energy. So that is where. So you can have, without the use of this energy, you can trap the water from the air. Okay. Now the researchers designed their system around a class of porous crystals called metal organic frameworks. So that's what uh, in short, it is called MOF. This metal organic frameworks is the discovery of the century, actually the decade, developed years ago by a chemist called Omar Yamagachi, uh, now in University of California and Berkeley. Now, the MOF scientists can select the chemical properties of each MOF and thereby customize its uses beyond their versatility MOFs 
gives great promise lies with their phenomenally large pores. The surface area inside is almost 10 times that of a porous zeolites. Now you are all familiar, the zeolites are used in humidifiers, okay? Now, for uh, context of one gram of MOF crystal, the size of a sugar cube has an essential internal surface area approximately equal to the area of a football field. So when you have so much of a surface area, which is capable of absorbing moisture and convert it into water, you can imagine the, uh, the uh, outcome or the importance of that, okay? Now, the device which I have experimentally uh, developed can harvest 2.5 liters, 2.8 liters of water daily per every kilogram of MOF. That is the metal organo uh, factor. Even at relative humidity, as low as 20%. So we, most of the desert conditions or arid conditions, we have less than 20% humidity. So if that is a, uh, uh, similar to those deserts, now, it requires no additional input of energy. That's a most interesting. These investigators see more room for improvement, further experimentation with the MOF composition should make the technology less expensive and uh, increase the amount of water collected per unit of material and allow researchers to tailor MOFs to different microclimates. So that is what is now several places in the Gulf areas or desert areas of the United States and many other uh, region. This MOFs uh, used uh, vessels are uh, designed with by which with just by standing in the open air you can collect the uh, water. Okay. Now there are several startups which has already begun selling. A solar based system that does not have to be hooked up to an electric grid. So you are avoiding energy, and a solar panel provides energy that both drives air through a proprietary water absorbing material and powers condensation of the extracted moisture into fluid. Okay. Now, the unit with one solar panel, the company says, can produce two to five liters of liquid a day, which is stored in a 30 liter reservoir that adds calcium and magnesium for health uh, and uh, taste. Okay. So these systems have been placed in Southwestern United States, in Mexico, in Jordan, and United Arab Emirates. And uh, when most people think about solar, uh, we are, uh, uh, a system which is available, which is readily can be used without uh, involving uh, electricity and huge expenditure. So that is one of the uh, revolutionary technology which I wanted to uh, highlight. This next one, <clears throat> second, fuel from artificial leaf. We have been hearing all these years uh, that is how to generate fuel from artificial leaf. You know, the photosynthesis. You now the technology that mimics photosynthesis converts carbon dioxide to fuels in a sustainable way. Now, by many, many investigators have contributed over the years to the development of a form of artificial photosynthesis in which sunlight activated catalyst split water molecules to yield oxygen and hydrogen the latter being a valuable chemical for a wide range of sustainable technologies. A step closer to actual photosynthesis would be to employ this hydrogen in a reduction reaction that converts carbon dioxide into hydrocarbons. Like a real leaf, this system would use only carbon dioxide, water and sunlight to produce fuels. The achievement could be revolutionary, enabling creation of a closed system in which a carbon dioxide emitted by combustion was transformed back into fuel instead of adding to the greenhouse gas in atmosphere. So the, at the site of production of carbon dioxide itself, we can use it. Recently, one group has demonstrated that it is possible to combine water splitting 
and carbon dioxide conversion in the fuels in one stem with high efficiency. And uh, that is again a uh, res uh, various investigators are paid solar water splitting technology and with microbes specially engineered to produce fuel all in a single container. Remarkably, these metabolically engineered bacteria generated a wide variety of fuels and other chemical products, even at low CO2 concentrations. The approach is ready for scaling up to the extent that the catalyst already contain cheap, readily obtainable metals. So that is the artificial photosynthesis or the artificial leaf you can generate. Now, this achievement could enable carbon dioxide, enable creation of a closed system in which CO2 emitted by combustion was transformed back into fuel instead of adding to greenhouse gases. So that is uh, another uh, uh, disruptive uh, potential. Next, uh, number three, artificial intelligence. We all know now how, what all systems started working on artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence that sees like humans, okay? Now, since we are dealing with brain, that is called a deep learning tool for visual task is changing medicine, security, and many more uh, factors. For the past 30 years, the computer vision technologists have struggled to perform well, even in tasks as mundane as accurately recognizing faces in a photograph. Recently, Though breakthroughs in deep learning and emerging field of artificial intelligence, this is called the deep learning, have finally enabled computers to inter interpret many kinds of images as successfully as or better than people can do. The companies have already selling, started selling products that exploit the technology, which is likely to take over or assist in a wide range of jobs that people now perform from driving trucks to interpreting scans for diagnostic and medical disorders. So that is all the now recent progress in a deep learning approach known as convolutional neuronal network, that is called CNN, is the key to the latest, latest strides. To give a simple example of its powers, consider images of animals, whereas humans can easily distinguish between a cat and a dog, the convoluted neural network allow machines to categorize specific breeds more successfully than people can. It excels because it is better able to learn and draw inferences from subtle telling patterns in the images. So that is the uh, artificial intelligence and we we already use now in use of the you all know i don't want to uh, take over the uh, uh, role now the deep learning for visual tasks is making some of the broadest inroads in medicine where it can speed experts interpretation of scans and pathology slides and provides critical information in places that lack professionals trained to read the images be it screening diagnosis, monitoring of disease progression or response to therapy. So, so one can imagine the uh, importance. Number four, what we call precision farming. Now, sensors, imaging and real-time data analytics improve farm output and reduce waste, okay? As the world's population grows, farmers will need to produce Produce more and more food. Yet, arable acreage cannot keep pace, and the looming food security threat could easily devolve into regional or even global instability. To adapt, large farms are increasingly exploiting precision farming to increase yields, reduce waste, and mitigate the economic and security risks that inevitably accompany agricultural uncertainty. Towards this, we, the, the, based on the regional conditions and the historical data, precision farming's, farming in contrast combines sensors, robots, GPS mapping tools, 
and data analytics software to customize the care that plants receive, all without increasing labor. Stationary or robot mounted sensors and camera equipped drones wirelessly send images and data on individual plants. Information say about stem size, leaf shape, and the moisture of the soil around the plant to a computer which looks for signs of health and stress. Farmers receive the feedback in real time and then deliver water, pesticide, or fertilizer in a calibrated doses to only the areas that need it. The technology can also help farmers decide when to plant and harvest crops. So you, in other ways, you can uh, sense the individual plants or individual leaf and treat it instead of spreading, spraying pesticide, the whole field or as the practice now, okay? Now, as a result, the precision farming can improve the time management, reduce water and chemical use, produce healthier crops and higher yields, all of which benefit farmers, bottom lines, and conserve resources while producing chemical runoff. And many startups are developing new software, sensors, aerial-based data, and the the tools for precision farming. So this is uh, uh, another wonderful uh, technology which is going to uh, change our world. Okay. Next, now mapping every cell. The global project aims to understand how all human cell types function or reaction. Now, to truly and deeply understand how the human body works and how diseases arise, you would need an extraordinary amount of information. You would have to know the identity of uh, every cell type in every tissue, exactly which genes, proteins, and other molecules are active in each type. What processes control the activity? Where the cells are located exactly? How the cells normally interact? with one another and what happens to the body's functioning when genetic or other aspects of a cell undergo change among other details. Now, building such a rich complex knowledge base may seem impossible and yet a broad international consortium of research groups has taken the first steps toward creating exactly that. They call it the human, human cell atlas. Okay, that is them. We already have the human genome. Now we are on the human cell atlas. Now this atlas, which will combine information from uh, existing and future research projects has been made possible by host of technological achievements. Those include advances in tools for isolating individual cells for pro profiling the pro proteins in a single cell at any given time and for quickly and inexpensively sequencing the DNA and RNA. It will integrate research exploring all the ohms that you are genome, the full set of genome, the transcriptosome and the proteome and the metabolome and such as sugars, fatty acids and amino acids involved in general generated by cellular process. And the, then these findings will be mapped to different sub-regions of cells. The integrated results should lead to a tool that will stimulate all the types and states of cells in our body and provide new understandings of disease processes and ways to inter, intervene in them. You know, one of the most advanced pieces of under, under, underlying uh, the cell atlas is the continually updated human protein atlas. It offers a glimpse of the kind of comprehensive work that goes into building the umbrella project as well as the value it will ultimately bring. So that once we have the, this already far, uh, very, very advanced stage, the human cell atlas. Okay. The next is uh, number six, the medicine for medicine and biotech what we call liquid biopsies. Now, ultra-sensitive blood tests promise to improve cancer diagnosis and care 
of not only cancer, many other diseases. A tool known as a liquid biopsy, which finds signs of cancer in a simple blood sample, promises to solve those problems and more. A few dozen companies are developing their own technologies. Observers predict that market for the test would be worth millions or billions. Right now, the tests which are available from several companies mostly aid in treatment decisions for people already diagnosed with a particular form of cancer, such as prostate or lung. But the liquid test can provide additional services that tissue biopsies cannot. Repeated tests could potentially delete, detect disease progression or resistance to treatment long before it would trigger symptoms or appear on imaging. Tissue biopsies examine only selected bits of tumors and thus can thus miss cells that have turned more dangerous than their neighbors. In principle, the liquid biopsy can detect the full spectrum of mutations in a mass, indicating when more aggressive treatment is uh, needed. Crucially, liquid biopsies may one day provide a fast easy uh, screening test for detecting a cancer and determining its type in people who seem perfectly healthy. So, which is the, the next technology, the hydrogen cars for, for the masses. We already have uh, the electric cars on the road. Now the hydrogen cars for the masses. Reducing precious metals makes fuel cell catalysis affordable in order to use the hydrogen. Now we all know the battery powered electric vehicles that give off no carbon dioxide are about to become mainstream. Today they constitute less than 1% of all rolling stock on the road globally, but multiple innovations in features such as the battery's cost and lifetime have made precise uh, prices so competitive. Okay, that uh, for example, the, the number one electric car company Telsa has more than 400,000 advance orders now for the, uh, which was uh, initially it was so expensive, but the prices have come down. Okay. Now, unfortunately, the other great hope for vehicles that exhaust no carbon, those powered by hydrogen led fuel cells remains too pricely for the broad sales. That's the hydrogen based sale. That's what is a raft of laboratories and business, however, are determined to cut cost by replacing one of the most expensive components in a fuel cells, the catalyst. Many commercial versions contain the precious metal platinum, which aside from being pricey, is too rare to support ubiquitous use in vehicles. Two commercial catalysts tend to consist of thin layers of platinum nanoparticles deposited on a carbon film, and researchers are also testing alternative substances. Uh, so that's why the hydrogen uh, cars are coming to, uh, to the market in a few years. Now, another example is that, uh, you, we all started reading and hearing about genomic vaccines. Now the vaccines composed of DNA or RNA could enable rapid development of preventives for infectious disease. Right now, our the great pandemic, we are successful in developing vaccines and uh, started already started using it. Now the standard vaccines to prevent infectious disease consist of a killed or weakened pathogens or proteins from those microorganisms. They work by teaching the immune system to recognize certain bits of protein called antigens on the surface of the pathogen as a foe. The immune system is then prepared to pounce the next time it encounters those foreign antigens. Now in this case, the vaccines that treat cancer also very uh, rely on proteins which the doctors may deliver to patients to enhance immune responses. These proteins can include the immune system's own guided missiles, what is called the antibodies. Okay. In contrast, a new kind of vaccine, which is poised to make 
major inroads in medicine consist of genes, genomic vaccines promised to offer many advantages, including faster manufacture when a virus such as Zika or Ebola or uh, Corona suddenly becomes more virulent or widespread. They have been uh, decades in the making, but dozens have now entered clinical trials. Now, genomic vaccines take the form of DNA or RNA that encodes desired proteins. On injection, the genes enter cells, which then churn out the selected proteins. Compared with the manufacturing proteins in cell cultures or eggs, producing the genetic material should be simpler and less expensive. Further, a single vaccine can include the coding sequences for multiple proteins and it can be changed readily if a pathogen mutates or uh, properties need to be added. So that is the advantage of uh, genomic vaccines. The researchers are working to improve the technology, for example, by finding more efficient ways to get genes into cells and by improving the stability of the vaccine in heat. Oral delivery, which would be valuable where medical personnel are scarce, is not likely to be feasible anytime soon, but nasal administration is being studied as an alternative. Optimism is high that any remaining obstacles such as this can be resolved. And the, now, the next, another important aspect is the, what is called the sustainable uh, communities. Now, instead of greening, individual houses, entire blocks of homes are retrofit into a single efficient unit. Now, in the past decade, the construction and retrofitting of individual homes to reduce energy and water use has grown explosively. Yet, applying green construction to multiple buildings at once may be an even better idea. Sharing resources and infrastructure could reduce waste and retrofitting impoverished and moderate income neighborhoods could also bring cost saving and modern technology to people who would typically like such opportunities. Working at the neighborhood level does add complexity to planning, but these neighborhood efforts offer rewards that even green single family homes cannot offer. There are, uh, for example, the, to begin with one such excellent example is the Oakland Eco Block Project, which led to the University of California, Berkeley with uh, a professor of architecture and urban design. It's a multidisciplinary endeavor involving urban designers, engineers, social scientists, and policy experts from the city, state, and federal government, academia, private industry, nonprofits, and grassroots organizations. So instead of this program, which has been planned in great detail, but has not yet begun construction, will retrofit 30 to 40 contiguous old homes in a lower to middle income neighborhood. And uh, we expect to rapidly recoup the money spent on infrastructure with savings from operating expenses while ensuring residents long-term comfort and security. Okay. So these measures should reduce annual electricity consumption by more than half and bring carbon emissions to zero a valuable feat considering that more than a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions emanate from residences. So that is uh, now, now another important, what you call, we all heard about quantum computing. Okay? The new algorithms and techniques open the door to innovate applications. Now quantum computing has captured imaginations for almost 50 years. The reason is simple. It offers a path to solving problems uh, that could never be answered with classical machines. Example in good, examples include simulating chemistry exactly to develop new molecules and materials, as well as solving complex optimization problems, which seek the best solution from among many possible alternatives. Every industry has a 
need for optimization, which is one reason this technology has so much disruptive potential. Quantum computers tackle problems by harnessing the power of quantum mechanics. Rather than considering each possible solution one at a time, as a classical machine would, they behave in ways that cannot be explained with classical analogies. They start out in a quantum superposition of all possible solutions, and then they use entanglements and quantum interference to home in one of the correct answer, the processes that we do not observe in our everyday lives. So that is the existing machines still not still too small to fully solve problems more complex than supercomputers can handle today. Nevertheless, tremendous progress has been made. Algorithms have been developed that will run faster on a computer quantum machine. Techniques now exist that prolong coherence in the lifetime of quantum information in superconducting quantum bits by a factor of more than 100 compared with the 10 years ago. We can now measure the most important kinds of quantum errors. And uh, the uh, IBM, famous IBM has already provided public access to the first quantum computer in the cloud, the IBM Q experience with a graphical interference for programming it and now an interface based on popular programming language, Python. So these are uh, uh, technology and one of the, I have already spoke about uh, 10. And the last one, which I would do, you all will be exciting to know that one of the projects which was take, undertaken uh, several years ago was getting lab meat on the plates, okay? The meat which you prepare in the lab can be served on the plate. Now, <clears throat> Again, you know, the, all these requires funding in large millions and millions of dollars, but the results are there. Now, the, the only country which can invest so many billions of dollars in this kind of investigation is the United States, no doubt. We all know that. Now, the authorities in the United States agreed on how to regulate food products cultured from animal cells. Because the tissue culture technology has in such an advanced stage, laboratories started cloning and producing uh, animal species, including one incidence of human uh, cloning in China. So paving the way to get so-called lab meat on American place, you need regulatory mechanisms for which uh, the Department of Agriculture and the FDA agreed to share regulation of cell cultured food products. So it's available in the market now. Technical details have yet to be confirmed. The FDA would oversee the collection and differentiation of cells when stem cells develop to specialized cells, while the USDA would oversee production and labeling of food products. Now this, so you have a regulatory uh, framework. will leverage both the FDA's experience regulating cell culture technology and living biosystems and the USDA's expertise in regulating livestock and poultry products for human consumption. The backers of lab meat say avoiding slaughtering animals will reduce both suffering and greenhouse emissions. So you can now produce goat meat or chicken meat or beef, whatever it is, you can large scale production in the laboratory. And it's already the other day, I read, uh, you must have read, in Singapore, there is a market, uh, supermarket started selling this uh, uh, cell cultured meat, chicken or uh, beef or pig or whatever meat you want, they have already started selling the meat you can buy and they already start serving in the uh, uh, restaurants. So the advantage is you don't have to kill animals. That's what the, the, uh, the animal lovers, uh, the backers of lab meat say, avoiding slaughtering of animals will reduce both suffering and greenhouse effects. So these are all what is called, uh, I have uh, spoke about uh, uh, 11 uh, technologies, uh, which are uh, in my title, which they say the scientific American labeled as, these are going to, these are called disruptive technologies going to change the world in the coming 
decades okay and uh, that's all about uh, so i didn't want to because there is nothing of my own uh, uh, research data so i avoided now the one uh, since there are uh, students one last advice to students uh, i have an advice now don't view education as a ticket to a job view it as the beginning of a process that you enjoy and one you are not going to stop when you get your degree develop the desire to absorb new knowledge try to be good in something it could be art medicine engineering science technology humanities sanskrit whatever it is you don't want to be too much of a generalist and not a specialist in anything so whatever area you choose try to do something and try to be good in something you all will be successful and that should be the motive you should not stop with that the uh, the opportunities in science and technology is uh, enormous and tremendous and uh, we should uh, uh, never stop learning and listening to uh, so the one of the purpose of this uh, academy uh, organizing these le- uh, lecture uh, workshops to undergraduate and postgraduate students is that uh, you listen you get an opportunity to uh, listen from uh, experts those who have spent several years and years in the laboratory and made their own contributions and they are able to not only their contribution they are uh, capable of uh, analyzing others contribution and also uh, make it a medium to uh, students the young minds so that the creative the uh, the uh, you know we colleges and universities produce creative minds so if your mind is to be creative be creative you have to listen to these things and the academy wants to highlight these things to the expose the students to this kind of uh, thing and uh, uh, will be more uh, uh, most of the talks the, the the fellows who go and give the talk will be usually uh, highlighting the importance and significance and uh, uh, of the uh, discoveries and the path which is taken by the scientist in achieving it so that it stimulates you the young minds and uh, if one produce uh, present a uh, you know laboratory data uh, that will not be much of interest to you because you are at this stage you are not only when you start your own research and your own interest then you are interested in knowing uh, the uh, the data produced by the senior scientist but ultimately what comes out of it is uh, by way of so uh, i'll be glad to have answer any if anyone has any questions what i try to uh, highlight and bring to your notice some of these technologies which is, you already know in the offing and uh, but the the uh, importance the significance and the potential which which is going to change the world that is a change from the established way of doing things now from which that ways will be changed okay so uh, uh, if anybody has any questions i am uh, available uh, thank you so much sir and we understand that I how this so. innovative technology create wonders in our society especially in farming and transportation in every aspect of uh, human life this can create wonders and i am asking if anybody have doubt please come forward and type your questions in the chat box so may i ask you one question uh you said that uh, this meat is made in laboratories artificially uh will that be equally uh, equal uh, amount of protein as a natural meat contain will it be healthy for us oh sure oh sure you know absolutely 
absolutely you can that is what while during the process of your production in the lab you check every ingredient as good as the uh, natural one even even if you take a different you, for example you take two chicken or two species two different uh, cattle or uh, uh, beef uh, the way you are uh, grown the nutritious food is given to the meat quality different isn't it the meat quality from the natural uh, living animals varies from place to place because they depending on the feed on which they grow that's why if you if we take if we buy and take uh, meat in the united states because the beef the cattle are grown uh, only for the production of beef so those uh, beef is different from the beef what we eat in our country entirely because of the nutrition value including the you know, so the lab you have the quality control mechanism the process you can check every level it is checked you can check the which amino acid is missing which protein i mean uh, the uh, you can add you can uh, delete or all this so ultimately you can get a feel for the good stuff that's the advantage which in the natural animals when you kill it is not possible okay yes yes but we today we know this chicken chicken all kinds of feed is given lot of steroid is given lot of antibiotics is given so all those things the same way while well, when you grow commercially in a lab you can uh, control all this that is what is done so the lab growth is already started selling available in the market people started buying it okay okay sir thank you so much uh, um there is no other questions i think uh, we can wind up this session thank you sir for your time okay 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 thank you very much and uh, happy new year to everyone thank you now i invite dr susan ipan ma uh, for vote of thanks she is a member of department of science i welcome you ma'am good evening everybody can you hear me yes ma'am we can hear can you, you but uh, we cannot see you okay okay now it's clear good evening everybody although there is a formal vote of session a vote of uh, thanks tomorrow at the end of the session it is essential to specifically thank today's speakers i use this opportunity to thank our principal and our manager reverend thomas john who spoke during the inaugural session dr baskar saha from st xavier's college mumbai was the first speaker and he delivered the first lecture and uh, spoke on basics in brain development adult neurogenesis and its therapeutic potential in a neurodegenerative diseases thank you dr baskar saha for the excellent and informative lecture Dr. Vidhya Vaidya from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, and the Patnagar Awardee delivered two beautiful lectures and took us to new realms in science, especially in the areas of how brain changes with experience and understanding the neurobiology of emotions. i place on record our special thanks to dr vidhya vaidya for accepting our invitation in spite of her busy schedule thank you dr vidhya vaidya dr edithil vijayan convener of the program 
had delivered a lecture on recent innovative technologies beneficial to society. Thank you, Dr. Vijayan, for the wonderful lecture and also for uh, being the convener of the program. I thank Dr. Neelima Renjit, who, in spite of sudden bereavement in her family, could be back on her toes and did her duty as a coordinator with wonderful precision. Neelima, please accept our sincere thanks for coordinating this program. I place on record our sincere thanks to Shema Kovur for the prayer song in the morning and also to Niduna and Parvati for comparing the program and also for the projections. There are so many people behind the scene like Dr. Sarin Sarah John, John then um, Dr. Shirley Thomas, Elizabeth Matthew, Shah Mohan and many, many others. I thank all of you. Finally, I would like to place on record our special gratitude to the participants without whom today's program would not have been a success. A big thank you to all of you. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, everyone. And see you tomorrow. And in between, there is a gentle reminder. E-certificate will be provided to those who attend uh, both day sessions. So make sure you attend it completely. Once again, thank you, everyone. And see you tomorrow. Thank you.